Okrimi Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomolikai, writer, public speaker, activist, and communications expert Nadine Dutz, joins me to unpack her book titled Hot Water. You have been in constant pain and unable to do many things that other people take for granted. So what inspired you to pen this book and how was it sharing your story? I think I was inspired by just the ability to be able to share what I've endured because I know that there are other people like me who perhaps feel alone and isolated or they might not know what it is that they can do in order to advocate for themselves and ask questions and so forth. So it was really important for me that I share my story and hopefully bring awareness to issues of, um, you know, faulty health care system and how it affects uh, people who live with chronic illnesses and chronic pain. And talk to us more on how living with endometriosis affected your life and daily challenges you face. Uh, it's been a very challenging illness. I started with my symptoms when I was in um, high school. And so it was quite debilitating because I missed out on a lot of school. I couldn't partake in things that I, you know other people at school were doing, like PE classes and so forth. I couldn't partake in that because I was just in too much pain. I would get sent home from school a lot because I was unwell. And um, as time progressed, I also then had similar experiences at university and work life as well has been quite difficult because people don't really understand what the issue is. And especially, this is especially important when people can't see your illness or your disability. They can sometimes treat you very strangely because it's not something that's visible. So when you're telling them, I'm not feeling well or something is wrong, sometimes you don't get the support that you should be getting because people don't understand what it is that you're going through simply because they can't see it. So I've experienced lots of challenges the same way even in the health system I've experienced, experienced challenges because people are just unaware of what it is that I'm dealing with and they don't always have the know-how or the answers so it's been very really difficult in that sense. And talk to us more on how living with this illness has shattered so many dreams of yours, especially of going to study medicine and becoming a doctor. Yeah, no, it's shattered so many uh, things for me. Um, when I was younger, when I was in high school, I really thought I would make an excellent doctor and I had chosen subjects to fall in that line of work and I was really just dedicated and as I got older obviously I found out what was wrong with me and I had had all of these challenges already and so then finding that you know having to come to terms with the fact that I won't be able to do that line of work because physically I'm not able to Especially if you think about the in-service that people do where they are constantly going, they're on their feet for long hours. It was just not conducive to my condition. And so it was really disappointing when I, you know, I had to realize and come to terms with the fact that this was most likely a plan of mine that was just not going to come to fruition because of the limitations of my, my body and, you know, the difficulty of having chronic pain as well. It, it would just be far too difficult for me. But it's very really hard to come to terms with those things. And and then you have to start thinking, well, what can I do? And that's a whole different ball game altogether because it's it's difficult to sit and think, what is it that my body is able to do while also fulfilling my own dreams and my own understanding about what I want to do as a person. And talk to us more about the difficulties and complications under privileged women living with this chronic illness especially those reliant on public health care system face? Well, there's a lot of um, discrimination. There's a lot of stigmatization. And there's still a lot of biases and racism and even classism that comes into play. Some of the difficulties we face is when we go into a hospital setting, there are assumptions made about us, especially in the public health system, wherein people will assume, based on just your skin 
or who you are or the community you're from, they will make assumptions about you and say to you, no, they can't help you because you've gone and done something to yourself that has now resulted in your, your symptoms. Instead of investigating, instead of doing examinations and tests and so forth to figure out what the problem is, they make assumptions purely based on looking at people. And aside from that, those assumptions that they make it is so dangerous because when you are sitting there making an assumption and you are convinced that that's what's going on, you don't ever look beyond that. So you never get to help someone because you have decided already that what they are and who they are comes into play so much that it, it's just it's like it's a point in seeing beyond who we are as as uh, individuals. Another important thing that I should mention is that lots of times in our communities, uh, especially lower income communities with people of color, we've all been taught that we don't question authority figures and that includes doctors. So when doctors are, are mistreating us, we don't question them, we don't report them because we've been taught that they are authority figures and that we should just play small and we should be grateful for the care that we are provided. But we know that that's not how it should be. You should be able to raise your concerns with, with your doctor and you should be able to ask for a second opinion. But um, oftentimes that's not provided for the majority of us. So between those those things of stigmatization and uh, also the system being overburdened and those of us who are within the healthcare sector not knowing that we can seek another treatment option, that we can report doctors who are doing the wrong things, the problem continues because we're not addressing the problem as we should. And it's a difficult thing, it's a challenge. So I think that within the healthcare system, we must acknowledge that there are flaws and there are times where the healthcare system doesn't allow for further treatment for those of us who it already stigmatizes. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's important to note. So what changes should be made in our healthcare system to better treat people with this illness? I think that we should continue to uh, educate and raise awareness because I think when we do that, we can also shift the way our healthcare providers um, treat people. Uh, one thing that I'm really passionate about is that I would like for healthcare providers to pick up my book and read it. And the reason for that is that I think that once someone is confronted with these things, maybe they are able to then in their day-to-day -day work when they are uh, confronted with patients who are not white or who come from a, a system uh, or class or environment where they are uh, disenfranchised or living in poverty, that um, you don't immediately confront that person with your own prejudice and your own biases and that you check that at the door and you treat them like you would treat any other patient and you give them the best possible care. So what I think needs to change is that people need to be made aware that they have these biases and they have these limitations that could impact someone's life negatively. So I think that it's really important, whether it's at a university level or whether it is at a, a hospital institution level, that there is some work done around uh, teaching people to not operate from a place of, of biases and prejudice and even racism and classism and um, misogyny. So I think that that's something that has to change, not just in the treatment of endometriosis, but in the treatment of sexual and reproductive health of women in this country. Um, we have to start taking ourselves out of the equation when we are confronted with someone who needs our help and um, that we are able to be open-minded and provide the help that people need um, so that they can live healthy lives. And March is Endometriosis Awareness Month and is an opportunity for all women to understand more about this condition. So Nadine, what symptoms must women look out for? Some of the symptoms um, that that people can look out for is that, you know, we've all been taught this thing where people will say to you that your period is not a sickness and that it, it will hurt and you must deal with that hurt. 
Um, so that's something that we need to reconsider because uh, it's not normal. It's not, no of course, yes, your muscles are contracting and it might be a, a bit of discomfort and a little bit of pain. But this idea that uh, excruciating pain during your menstrual cycle where you can't do anything else is normal is not true. So we need to start looking for if you have extreme pain during your, your menstrual cycle and you are dealing with that, uh, you need to be aware that that is also a symptom of endometriosis. If you're dealing with heavy bleeding and bleeding for long periods of time, that is a symptom, uh, including things like fatigue, nausea, problems with your digestive system, um, you know, uh, lower back and leg pain, dizziness and so forth during your period. Um, it's not normal and it, it could possibly point to uh, different issues within the reproductive system that we have to take seriously. So those are just some of the signs and symptoms of this disease. And of course, it's a progressive disease. So as time goes on, it does get worse and it does start causing more complications if not handled properly. And lastly, Nadine, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? I hope that people will, will be able to find their own voice and become brave enough to stand up for themselves, to raise awareness about things that affect them, and that they will be able to decipher what is what is this thing and how can I uh, you know, raise awareness and protect others from this condition. I'd also like to teach people how to advocate for themselves, how to ask questions, how to ensure that you are being treated fairly and um, treated with the, the respect and dignity that you need, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of who you are and where you come from and what uh, race and background you are from. You should be given the same amount of care that someone else gets. And that's something that is really important and something that we must learn as a people if we hope to um, progress in our democracy and we hope to have a country where we are all equal under uh, the law. The other thing is, is that I hope that people in positions of authority, in positions where they are taking care of other people's health. I hope that those people will also pick up the book and be able to, you know, have those moments where they go, oh, my goodness, I didn't consider this and I should consider this in my line of work because it can be detrimental to someone else. And so I hope that those people who are in those positions are able to, to learn from my book and, and may, perhaps then go into their work with a different approach and a different attitude where they are treating people with kindness, with sensitivity, with respect, um, regardless of how you've been taught to think about certain people and to think about um, their well-being and their needs and that you will provide them with the care that they need. So over and above, I hope that this book inspires different groups of people to treat each other with respect and to speak up when you feel that you are not being heard or respected. That was Nadine Duck speaking to Prima Media's Polity about her book titled Wood Water.